Uh, thank you. So at last year's conference, um, inflation scarcely gained a, a mention. Uh, today, it is the critical issue facing central banks. From a longer term perspective, of course, inflation is not a new issue. Uh, but for more than a decade and even longer in Japan, central banks have been wrestling with how to deal with inflation that is too low, not too high. Suddenly, concerns about the limits to monetary policy posed by the effective lower bound on nominal interest rates seem much less relevant. Uh, instead, the primary challenge has shifted to one of containing a surge in inflation. Um, this figure shows uh, in the top panel uh, CPI inflation, in the bottom panel core CPI inflation for the US in blue, um, Japan in red, the euro area in black, and the UK in green. Um, the shaded region is the COVID recession and US dated uh, recession. Um, COVID-19 caused a sharp contraction in output in major industrialized economies, uh, and inflation fell to zero in the first half of 2020. As demand rebounded and supply constraints and disruptions created by COVID created an imbalance between demand and supply, inflation rose, exceeding 2% in the US by the um, early 2021, and in the UK and Euro area by the middle of 2021. In Japan, inflation has been below the BOJ's 2% target, and core inflation bottom panel has, at least until March, been negative. However, adjusting for the decline in mobile phone charges, CPI inflation in Japan did reach 2.1% in the first quarter of 2022, while adjusted core CPI inflation was 0.7%. But the Japanese economy, unlike the other three economies, has not yet experienced sustained rates of inflation in excess of their target. But for the other three, inflation is now the pressing issue for policymakers. However, the central banks in the US, UK, and Euro area uh, were slow to react to rising inflation. The Bank of England began raising its policy rates in November of 2021. Uh, the Fed didn't raise its rates until March of 2022, and the ECB has still not changed its policy rate. Of course, what matters are real interest rates. So here are some series on real interest rates for the US. The top panel shows the one-year real rate in solid blue, the two-year real rate in uh, dashed blue, uh, based on treasury yield and um, expectations uh, based on data from financial markets and financial market participants. The bottom panel shows um, two series for uh, the one-year real rate based on household surveys of inflation. All measures suggest that in 2021, real interest rates reached their lowest level in the past 20 years. Um, all series begin to rise at the end of the um, data, the sample period shown here uh, as uh, uh, the Fed uh, started to tighten and in at anticipation of eventual further Fed tightening. However, they remain extremely low, um, especially uh, as measured by household uh, expectations. As I mentioned, household surveys tend to show higher expected inflation than measures obtained from financial market participants. However, households have been much more accurate in predicting the path of core inflation than have expectations derived by financial markets. So in this figure, the dark blue line is uh, CPI uh, inflation. The dashed is core PCE inflation. Uh, the red is a measure of household inflation expectations. The black is a measure from the Cleveland Fed based on financial market data and financial market participants. So households have been much more accurate in uh, foreseeing this surge in inflation. So the current environment with its high inflation and rising inflation uh, expectations brings reminders of the 1960s and 1970s, and with them concern that we may be headed to a new era of high inflation. So this, figure shows the uh, period of the great inflation in the U.S. Uh, beginning in 1960 and ending in 1985. The blue uh, line is CPI inflation. The dashed is core CPI, uh, PCE inflation, sorry. Um, uh, the oil price surges in this period are clearly visible in the inflation series. And notice that both core and overall PCE inflation were 
affected by these uh, oil price surges. The black line is the unemployment rate gap, the gap between the civilian unemployment rate and the Congressional Budget Office estimate of the natural rate of unemployment. The two large oil price shocks uh, are clearly visible. The red line shows a linear trend estimated from PCE inflation from 1960 to 1981. The major policy mistake of this period was not the volatility of inflation created by the oil price shocks, but it was the um, upward trend of inflation over a two decade long period. The challenge now is to prevent transitory inflation shocks uh, from increasing trend inflation. Okay, so in my talk today, uh, what I wanna do is, is address two broad questions. The first one is, have central banks fallen behind the curve and what are the implications of that? Uh, and in particular, is a policy delay in the face of an inflation, inflation surge uh, costly in terms of uh, uh, macroeconomic stability? And does a delay, that is if policymakers are slow in responding to an inflation um, surge, does that call for a more aggressive response once they do start acting? And then the second broad question is, uh, is a repeat of the 1960s and 70s a possibility? And here I wanna focus on um, uh, an older literature that asks the question about how you deal with uncertainty in setting monetary policy, because clearly we're in an environment of a high level of uncertainty, particularly about the duration of the shocks. Uh, the, the shocks associated with COVID-19 are clearly um, unusual shocks relative to the um, uh, historical experience of the last 60 years. Uh, also, the war in U Ukraine created additional shocks. Um, are there lessons from the literature about dealing with uncertainty uh, that have been followed or, or not followed? And then has the consensus on maintaining low and stable inflation been lost? Okay, so to begin with, is the Fed behind the curve? Um, you know, as of last month, uh, almost every day saw opinion pieces uh, appearing, talking about the Fed being behind the curve, also the ECB being behind the curve. Uh, well, to be behind the curve, you need some sort of benchmark. And so what I've done here is uh, use the Taylor rule in the, Fe the Federal Reserve's monetary policy report to provide a benchmark for policy. So what's shown here is the black solid line down towards the bottom are the policy rates implied by the FOMC projections. That is, sorry, not implied by, but given in the FOMC projections from the December 2021 meeting. The red solid line were the Fed funds projections from the FOMC uh, meeting of March 22, the dashed lines are the values of the federal funds rate implied by the Taylor rule uh, from the December 2021 meeting, that's the black dashed line, and from the March 2022 line, that's the red dashed line. And to construct these, um, obviously I couldn't use actual inflation and uh, unemployment for the future. Uh, so they're based on the FOMC's own projections of inflation and unemployment plugging those into the Taylor rule and calculating what the implied funds rate would be. Um, actually, even in looking at the past um, uh, several years, uh, often you see inflation and unemployment plugged into a Taylor rule and compared with actual policy. But of course, if policy had followed those Taylor rule recommendations, actual inflation and unemployment presumably would have uh, been different. So this is taking the FOMC's own at projections, medium projections for future inflation and unemployment and saying what would the Taylor rule in their monetary policy report imply about the funds rate. And clearly there's a huge gap between uh, these two, suggesting that the, F the Fed is behind the curve uh, relative to a benchmark standard policy rule. Okay, so what are the consequences if the uh, Fed is behind the rule? Uh, is this delay in re responding uh, costly? Well, of course, the, the um, uh, economic theory, the Taylor principle says you should respond more than one for one to um, changes of inflation. And that's the basis on which the dashed lines are saying that in 
the federal funds rate should be much higher than um, the FOMC is projecting. But of course, you don't need to respond um, the full 1.1 1 .1 and a half uh, um, times inflation immediately if private sector behavior is based on forward-looking expectations, then it's the expectation that you will eventually respond fully that is gonna be important for macro stability. Uh, and so starting gradually and building up to the full response may be just as effective. So to address the question of whether it's costly to delay, what I do is take a, a, a simple New Keynesian framework as five equations, the New Keynesian Phillips curve with partial indexation, uh, an Euler equation with habits, Oaken's law equation to link unemployment and the output gap, and then the specification of monetary policy is a basic uh, Taylor rule. That's um, uh, this component here uh, with the uh, coefficient on inflation being phi um, uh, sub pi. Uh, this is the four quarter average inflation rate. Uh, the policy rule displays inertia consistent with most empirical estimates of policy rules. So rho i is the parameter that controls inertia, phi pi the response to inflation. K here is the delay. So uh, I allow K to run from zero to four uh, to, clarify, to make the figures easier to read. I'm only gonna look at the case of no delay, K equal to zero, that's the standard policy rule, and a delay of four quarters. So you wait a year before you respond. The underlying inflation shock is, is an ARIMA 1-3 process that allows the inflation shock to uh, be positive and then build up over three quarters before uh, gradually dying out. And then parameter values are, are standard, uh, taken either from Gali or from Dennis's estimates of the inertial parameters. Okay, so what does one obtain? First, I'm going to start with the basic rule. Uh, the estimated degree of inertia in the policy rule of 0 0.85 and a K of zero, so responding immediately. So here's the impulse response. The upper left panel is the nominal interest rate. The uh, upper right panel is the real interest rate. Lower left panel is the unemployment rate. And, and the lower right panel is the four quarter inflation rate. Um, and the panels in the subsequent figures will be identical the scale will change slightly, but the black line in, this, in subsequent figures will be identical to this black line here. So this is the basic uh, Taylor rule responding immediately. Okay, what about a four quarter delay? So the blue line here is the same policy rule, but you wait four quarters to respond. So you delay, but then you uh, behave normally. Uh, notice that shifts the behavior of the nominal interest rate to the right, reflecting the delay. But if you look at unemployment and four quarter inflation, um, there's some effect, but it's, it's not huge. And this is basically a reflection of what we know about the power of forward guidance, that a promise to respond strongly in the future uh, has immediate effects and can be virtually as powerful as um, responding immediately. One thing to note is that the delay does create larger subsequent fluctuations as the economy converges back to um, steady state. Okay, now I wanna look at a more aggressive policy. So suppose that there's a four quarter delay, but then in, instead of responding to an inflation, um, the inflation rate with a coefficient of 1.5, you respond with a coefficient of three. So you double the response to inflation. So this makes interest rates much more volatile um, and it presents the standard trade-off. If we look at the lower right panel, inflation is um, uh, peaks at a lower level. So it does dampen the rise in inflation. And as a consequence, it increases the peak unemployment rate. So you're getting the standard trade-off between stabilizing inflation and stabilizing unemployment. It also delay with more aggressive policy does tend to increase the subsequent fluctuations as the economy converges back to a steady state. Now I wanna ask about another interpretation of aggression. Suppose we reduce inertia. So you move more quickly instead of a delay, uh, a coefficient on lagged policy rates of 0 0.85, you reduce that to 0 0.5. 
Now that's the red line. Notice interest rates become much more volatile, uh, particularly uh, you start oversteering in some sense. And so you have to then reverse and oversteer in the other direction. But again, the net effect of unemployment and inflation it is not great. So again, it's the sort of, the, in some sense, the present discounted value of the policy that is mattering here, and that's less affected. But now suppose you respond quickly, but more aggressively. So you increase the coefficient on inflation from 1.5 to 3. And now uh, we get much bigger swings in um, uh, the policy rate. We start getting larger swings in inflation and unemployment. Again, the standard trade-off, you're stabilizing, limiting the rise in inflation, but at the cost of a higher increase in, it, in unemployment. And actually, if you keep increasing K, the model becomes unstable. So this oversteering increases until uh, the model becomes unstable. So what are the implications? So in a forward-looking model, credible delay has only modest implications for unemployment and inflation. So in that sense, if you're credible about the fact you're going to eventually respond, uh, potentially it has only a modest effect. But aggression, aggression uh, aggressive responses do raise some potential problems. Um, they raise the standard trade-off between stabilizing inflation or stabilizing unemployment. Um, but if you act with less inertia uh, and aggressively, that can be potentially destabilizing and generate instrument instability. Well, how robust are these results? Um, well, they're all based on assuming long-run expectations are anchored and are rational. Now, at last year's conference, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago President uh, Charlie Evans talked about inflation dynamics, and he provided an example of behavioral expectations, that is the deviation from rational expectations. And those behavioral expectations were borrowed from a a paper by Bianchi, uh, Fisher, and Melosi. And their, their expected future inflation was basically just assumed to be backward looking. And so now I repeat these five different policy options with the behavioral expectations. But if you can read the small caption in the, in the uh, upper right, the maximum lag here is only three, not four quarters, because the model becomes unstable uh, with a delay of four quarters. So an example that if expectations deviate from rational, that this issue of potential instability becomes much more important if you have delayed in responding and if you behave aggressively when you do respond. Okay, so it's very important in those exercises that inflation expectations were anchored in those earlier ones with rational expectations um, Ricardo Reese, in his review of the 1967-73 experience, uh, thought that one major problem was that uh, policymakers did not keep a close eye on measures of the expected inflation anchored and gave in to the temptation to dismiss them as temporary noise or as vague psychological factors. A more general lesson is that policy can play a role in where the anchor ends up. And that's one of the issues of the current environment is that often central banks have been talking as if inflation were somehow exogenous, just driven by temporary shocks and monetary policy did not need to respond uh, to really do anything, just wait until the shocks ended. Um, but policy plays an important role in where the anchor ends. And the reason that sort of not linking expectations and inflation uh, to policy and to li just linking it to shocks is illustrated by the somewhat ex surreal experience reflected in a 1978 FOMC meeting at which uh, Lawrence Roos, president of the St. Louis Fed at the time, said, according to the transcripts, I'm really not trying to be critical, but is our monetary policy responsibility such that we should maybe discuss whether we're satisfied to see the economy drift into an 8% inflation rate? And if not, are there things we can do to affect this? Are we in any ways the masters of what happens or, or are we merely observers on the sidelines? I'm lost. And then 
Federal Reserve Chairman G. William Miller drew upon the U.S. Constitution's uh, Fifth Amendment protection against self-incrimination in responding, I take the fifth. And sort of this example of members of the FOMC not, not being willing to accept their responsibility for inflation uh, was a, a problem in the 1970s and part of the background for the great inflation. Uh, fortunately, I think today, um, I'm confident that central bankers would, would not fail to connect uh, monetary policy with what was going on with um, inflation. And that may be a major difference between the 60s and 70s and the current uh, policy environment. So, but is a return to the 70s possible? Well, it's useful to review the sort of standard exp explanations for inflation. Um, there are four listed here. I'm going to focus on the first, supply shocks and special factors, and the last one, policy biases due to political pressures. Um, I'll, those are the ones I think apply uh, most specifically uh, to, today, to today's situation. Now, these aren't mutually exclusive um, explanations, of course. Okay, supply shocks and special factors. Again, let me quote Ricardo on this. Internal forecasts by the Fed, speaking about the 1970s, that all shocks had temporary effects led to a belief that inflation expectations remained anchored. Now, that sounds very similar to uh, recent um, Fed and ECB uh, statements about the fact that inflation is just going to go away because these shocks are temporary, and so it's just a uh, transitory rise in inflation. In the 1970s, the Fed underestimated the persistence of temporary shocks, and I think that's what the Fed and the ECB have also done in the face of the current inflation surge. Now, um, there are some lessons from earlier literature into what you should do when you're uncertain about the whether shocks are transitory or, or permanent. Specifically, that research found that because the costs of inflation and real fluctuations become larger, the more persistent the shock is, policymakers should overestimate the persistence of inflation shocks in designing policy. Thus, rather than treat an inflation shock as temporary, it would have been better if policymakers had acted as if the shock was likely to be very uh, persistent. Um, and some of that literature I surveyed in a, a Jackson Hole paper in 2003. Another uh, insight from roughly the same period about dealing with, with shocks comes from the work by Lars uh, Hansen and Tom Sargent on robust control uh, for monetary policy, in which um, policymakers act as if there's an evil agent that will try to make them look as bad as possible. And so they want to develop a robust policy that even in the worst case scenario will lead to reasonable outcomes. And um, I, in a practical application of the approach, I, sh I showed in a 2004 paper that the robust control uh, approach implies monetary policies should act as if the evil agent will hit you with a bad inflation shock just when you're already dealing with inflation above target. So in that literature, there really isn't an evil agent. Uh, Vladimir Putin um, uh, uh, doesn't really exist. Uh, but you design policy not thinking shocks are just going to be transitory, but in the expectation that you want to protect against a surge in inflation then being made worse by a further inflation shock. And I think both those lessons have been ignored by monetary policymakers in the current environment. Um, there are other results from dealing with uncertainty that apply to the Phillips curve and inflation dynamics. Again, there's a lot of uncertainty about the new Keynesian Phillips curve. And should that uncertainty lead policymakers to proceed with caution or with aggression? Um, so let me focus here mainly on the uh, uh, paper by Ulf Soderstrom who showed that uncertainty about inflation dynamics actually calls for more aggressive, a more aggressive response. That is not the standard Brainerd caution, but a more aggressive response. And a useful analogy to consider is the best way to respond to wildfires. An initial fire may burn itself out if fuel is scarce and weather conditions are calm, but weather conditions might change. 
if wind picks up and the fire may spread rapidly. If it spreads too much and finds plentiful fuel, it can begin to create its own weather intensifying the fire. The best strategy is to attempt aggressively to control even small fires to prevent them from spreading. Similarly, a rise in inflation may trigger rising inflation expectations that if left unaddressed lead to increases in wages and prices and result in a wage price spiral. A cautious approach waiting to see if inflation persists can put policymakers into the position the Fed finds itself today. So I think there were some useful lessons from this literature on uncertainty uh, that the Fed um, has uh, ignored. Uh, so the other explanation from the um, of the great inflation was a policy biases, uh, and I think we're there's a fear of that um, in today's environment because the Fed's objectives. I mean, one of the lessons from that earlier period was that the central bank needed clarity about their objectives, uh, clear and transparent communication about their inflation objectives. And I think we've moved away from that with the Fed's statement on long-run goals and monetary policy strategy from 2021, where the maximum employment goal is something that they say is not directly measurable and changes over time. And so it's not appropriate to specify a fixed goal for employment. Um, one problem with, with that, of course, is it's hard for central banks to be held accountable if they're unwilling to uh, tell you how you measure what they're trying to do. And I think the movement to flexible average inflation targeting also reduced the clarity of the inflation target, further clouding the um, uh, ability to assess what the Fed was going to do. And that leaves them more open to political pressures. And I know Ken referred to some of those with respect to other objectives that um, uh, there's been pressure on the Fed to pur pursue. And certainly there was I think a, a, a unwillingness to um, take steps that might address inflation because of the fear it would raise unemployment. And the Fed has continued to talk about this sort of soft landing. Um, and I think the unwillingness to face the sort of hard decisions necessary to control an inflation surge uh, is a current danger, uh, given that their goals and strategy are no longer clear and transparent. Okay, another issue is that um, there's a weakening of the consensus that grew out of the great inflation um, that central banks needed to be independent and have clear and well-defined uh, objectives. Uh, so this shows uh, the results of a survey for, from members of the, a sample of members of the American Economic Association that's been conducted since 1976, uh, asking uh, survey participants for their views on certain micro and macroeconomic propositions, and they're asked to agree, disagree, or agree with provisions. And so here are the results from two of those questions from surveys from 2000 to, through 2021, um, when these questions, 2000 was the first year these questions were on the um, survey. <clears throat> so the first one, should the, should the focus should focus on low inflation rather than real goals. So the yellow is the percent of respondents agreeing or agreeing with provisions. Uh, and the red is the share just straight agreeing without provisions. Um, and you can see that there's been a, a, a decline in the share of participants expressing agreement with the statement that the Fed should focus on low inflation rather than real goals. And a rise in the blue, that's the share disagreeing reflecting a weakening of the consensus about um, central banks focusing on low inflation. And the other aspect, and again, which uh, Ken uh, focused on in some of his talk, was that the, man the proposition, the management of business cycles should be left to the Fed, not to fiscal policy. And you can see the fraction agreeing with this, the yellow bar that is agreeing with provision has declined steadily, while the blue, the, the shared disagreeing has risen. So there's a bit, I interpret this as a real weakening of the consensus that grew out of the um, uh, great inflation and the great moderation. Um, <clears throat> so central banks have fallen behind the curve in addressing uh, the recent surge in inflation. Uh, the, oops, went the wrong way, sorry. Um, 
The implication of uh, standard monetary policy models suggests that the costs of delay are relatively small, but that's conditional on rational expectations and credibility of the promise to eventually respond to inflation in the, in the future. An aggressive response combined with delay can, however, produce volatility in the return to steady state, and that's even with rational expectations. When expectations deviate from rationality, uh, you're much more likely to generate instability in the economy if you delay and then respond aggressively. Um, I think the Fed has underestimated the persistence of inflation shocks and inflation inertia. Uh, the relevant theory suggested that policymakers should systematically overestimate the degree of persistence of inflation, not underestimate persistence in the hope shocks will quickly fade away without the need to do anything. The Fed has established an asymmetric, unmeasurable objective, employment objective, that opens it to political pressures and imparts an inherent, inherent inflationary bias to policy. Even among economists, there is declining support for monetary policy to focus on maintaining low and stable inflation and growing support for using fiscal policy, uh, raising issues that, as I mentioned, Ken discussed in his uh, Mayakawa lecture. So when combined with overconfidence in the belief in inflation expectations would remain anchored at 2%, even as some measures of household inflation expectations moved above 6%, the current situation offers uncomfortable reminders of the environment that led to the great inflation. The pessimistic view must be, therefore, that all the pieces are in place for a possible repeat of the 1970s. Let me conclude, though, by giving the optimistic view. Since December, the FOMC has consistently signaled that interest rates will rise. The credibility of the Fed's 2% inflation target still seems sufficient to keep long-term inflation expectations anchored, at least according primarily to financial market participants, but not households. While slow to address the rise in inflation, the power of forward guidance may mean that the late start to addressing the surge in inflation will end up mattering little. More importantly, there seems to be a recognition among policymakers that maintaining the inflation act, act, anchor requires action on the part of the central bank and that the trend rate of inflation will, is ultimately up to monetary policy. Only time will tell whether the advanced economies now facing surging inflation are able to quickly return it closer to 2%. If not, a costly recession is likely to be necessary to achieve a return to a low inflation environment. Ironically, the cost of such inflation will fall disproportionately on those the Fed had hoped to uh, hoped would benefit from an, pursuing a more inclusive expansion through a belief it could fine tune the economy to achieve a soft landing while successfully bringing down inflation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Walsh. Uh, let's now turn to the questions from the floor again. Please indicate uh, by uh, pressing the raise hand button. Uh, Mr. Sakine, please. Thank you very much. So uh, this is Toshi Sakine uh, from Hitotsubashi University and ex-BOJ officer. So I have met you, Professor Walsh. Mm -hmm. So very nice to see you, nice even though it's online. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your so very so uh, brilliant so lecture. Um, I just want to ask a simple question regarding that the role of the average inflation targeting. So you have already mentioned that so uh, the average inflation targeting obscured some sort of transparency here. But uh, at the same time, that so I just wonder that so well, if there is no uncertainty and if people are really rational expectation, uh, average inflation targeting is a wonderful idea, isn't it? That is a kind of literature is telling us. But if, so, as you mentioned and emphasized, that so uh, the the uncertainty of the shock is there, and also that so there is no so such sort of perfect so foresight or that sort of rational expectation behavior there, then it could be the case that so uh, introduction of the average inflation targeting by the Fed uh, is one reason why so they lag behind the curve. 
So whether it is a good so interpretation or not, just I want to ask that sort of question. And going forward, if we further so so speculate this kind of thing, that's so uh, the implication of the introduction of average inflation targeting thing. Uh, do you think whether there is any so real danger that so uh, if the shock is temporary, supposing wonderfully, but uh, because that's so this average inflation targeting things, uh, it could be the case that so Fed is overkill the economy. So do you think that is a kind of danger which is associated with introduction of the average inflation targeting? Thank you very much. Um, excellent questions. Um, and I, I sort of only briefly mentioned the average inflation target targeting in a non-flattering <laughs> way. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, in our models, average inflation targeting is a really good uh, policy. I think the problem was that it's designed, and the reason it, it was adopted is that the Fed was worried about the low inflation environment and the zero lower bound, and the really uh, 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 constraints imposed by central banks when inflation gets too low, particularly when the sort of neutral real interest rate is also very low. Um, and in those environments, it can work very effectively in models that assume sort of everybody fully understands what the Fed is doing. Um, I don't think it was designed to deal with a large inflation surge. Um, and now there's, I think, a lack of clarity. Um, do we really think that the Fed is going to bring inflation down low enough to average 2% inflation over the next couple of years? Given that inflation is now running at, you know, six, seven, eight percent, um, so PCE inflation for the first uh, three or four months of this year is, you know, closer to six and a half. You would really have to have uh, quite low inflation for a while to bring, say, average inflation down to two percent over the next two years. Um, and I don't see them doing that. So it's an asymmetric average inflation targeting. Now, apparently. Um, I learned <laughs> from a Brookings event that that's really what they intended, that it was going to be asymmetric, that if inflation got too low, they would allow it to rise above 2% for a while, but only in the low direction, not in the overshooting direction. But I think that just um, demonstrates how um, uh, the communication of the policy lacked transparency. Um, I think it, you're also right that it could have contributed to their delay in responding because as inflation started to rise, you know, in some sense, that was a good move uh, to let inflation rise because it, inflation had been too low and they had said, we'll, we'll be happy if it rises a bit. And they wanted to continue to push the economic expansion. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of confusing data from labor markets, a lot of different uh, uh, indicators one might look at. Uh, total employment is still below pre-pandemic levels, but many other or most other measures of labor market, um, labor markets in the U.S. suggested a very tight labor market. Uh, Larry Summers has suggested that the current unemployment rate uh, is more akin to a 2% unemployment rate in normal times. And so, um, you know, I think the, the signals were that, yes, we like a little bit more inflation, but the labor market was pretty tight. And so I think they should have been more weary of not responding. Um, and then, you know, on the upside now, it's not clear what inflation rate they would really like or what they're targeting uh, over the next couple of years. Long run, 2%, yes, that's fine. But what's average inflation targeting on the upside? Um, and I think really for transparency, transparency and clarity, uh, you need a more symmetric set of objectives, um, or at least I think those are easier to communicate to the public um, rather than more complicated policy. And, and communications is clearly important in keeping it um, uh, I reminded. Uh, uh, Rick Mishkin once gave a, a talk uh, titled uh, KISS. Keep it simple, stupid, um, in talking about Fed communications. That, you know, you really, you're not just talking to financial market participants. Uh, 
you're talking to households uh, and um, you need to keep communications very clear, which typically means keep it as simple as possible. And I think average inflation targeting added confusion about how strongly the Fed would react to inflation. Okay, let's next go to Mr. Orphanides. Uh, thank you, Kazuo. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Carl, for the uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, review of the risks. Uh, uh, let me summarize one element of the conclusion of things uh, I consider very important, and then, and then I will ask you a related question. So the way I see it, what you're saying is that uh, a central bank can fall behind the curve, as the Fed has clearly fallen behind the curve uh, over the past uh, year or so. But this is not really very costly if this is recognized uh, sufficiently early. And I believe uh, I agree with you that the Fed appears to have recognized this uh, in the last uh, three months, I would say, in, in my assessment. And then as long as inflation expectations stay well anchored and, uh, and the central bank stays uh, on top of inflation expectations, that's all good. Uh, I, I, the question I want to ask is, in the comparison of the strategies that you described, you have simple tailor rule responding to contemporaneous data or with a lag of a few quarters. Uh, neither of these options actually describes uh, my understanding of Federal Reserve policy uh, during the great moderation. Uh, and actually the, 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 the monetary policy of many other central banks that, that uh, were very successful during the great moderation period. My understanding of policy um, during that time is that uh, policy was preemptive. Uh, uh, for inflation targeting central banks, preemption mean, meant uh, responding when there were signals that inflation might deviate from the target at uh, the one or two year ahead uh, uh, forecast horizon. For the Federal Reserve, I recall that even if even before the Federal Reserve adopted its 2% uh, inflation objective in, in 2012, estimated policy reaction functions and the, and the, and the evidence we have uh, from policy discussions suggest that uh, uh, policy could be much better be characterized by looking at by looking at a systematic response to inflation at about a year horizon, three, three to four quarters ahead. So I was wondering, would you confirm in your model uh, that uh, if you have a, uh, what I would call the uh, Volcker, Greenspan, Bernanke style, preemptive monetary policy responding to year ahead projections of inflation, that would actually be even better than any of the policies you, uh, uh, you have and would keep inflation expectations uh, better is that is that the result? I expect it is, but, I, but I'm asking it as a question to see. And then, would you say that uh, one of the reasons that uh, the 2021 policy strategy change uh, uh, failed the Fed in this specific regard uh, is that the Fed pretty much threw away the preemptive element of its uh, of the policy strategy that it had adopted earlier. Uh, citing concerns about not knowing where the natural rate of unemployment was and citing concerns about inflation dynamics. And by throwing away the preemptive aspect of policy, by default, uh, the first time an inflation shock hit, they fell behind on the curve. Yeah, e excellent points. Um, and I think I agree with uh, uh, the general thrust of those. Certainly what we know from um, you know, even simple models, if there is, you know, inertia in inflation behavior, uh, habits and consumption behavior, any of the things that generate persi endogenous persistence in our models say that um, that policy needs to be forward looking, that you need to respond to your expectations of inflation. Um, so I haven't run those experiments. I, um, uh, um, I use the basic Taylor rule just because in some sense, the Fed, by putting it in its monetary policy report, although they did drop them from the last monetary policy report, um, you know, puts up a, a benchmark that presumably is a way to think about policy. And you need some sort of benchmark to really address, you know, what do we mean by being behind the curve? And so um, I took those as sort of simple illustrative uh, examples. Um, but you're right, you want to be forward looking, you want to respond to expectations of future inflation. 
Now, the issue there is that that requires you to have some model of that allows you to forecast inflation. And that includes uh, forecasting the shocks. Um, you know, a simple Taylor rule like I use, you know, one of its um, one reason it's potentially sort of robust in a wide variety of models is that it doesn't require you to um, know whether shocks are persistent or transitory. You respond the same way to a rise in inflation if it's a temporary shock or a transit or a permanent, more persistent shock. Um, and so again, I think the literature on uh, dealing with uncertainty says that if you're behaving in a preemptive way, that you're responding to your forecast of inflation, but in creating those forecasts, you should err on the side of assuming things are going to be a little more persistent than you maybe, you know, sort of truly believe. And that helps protect you against this, um, uh, not worst case, but uh, poor case scenario. Because again, because of the inherent dynamics in the economy, if you let inflation get a little bit out of control, that's going to tend to feed through in expectations, uh, three, feed through the sort of lagged adjustment of the private sector uh, and create further inflation problems. Um, I think it's also true that lacking uh, confidence that um, in some sort of inflation forecast model, you inevitably become less preemptive. Uh, and so I think that may be another uh, factor, as you mentioned, in why the Fed was slow in, in responding. Um, uh, but again, you know, it's, it's not always the case that caution is the right response in the face of uncertainty. Uh, you don't want to be too aggressive because, again, even in some of the simulations where you have this simple Taylor rule, everybody understands that's how you're behaving. You've got complete credibility. You can lead to, you can end up generating this oversteering problem that you oversteer too aggressively in one way, then you have to swing back and you actually introduce some instability in the economy uh, rather than stability. Thank you. Let's go to uh, Mr. Aoki for a final question, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is Kosuke Aoki from the University of Tokyo. And uh, thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. And my question is concerned with national debt. Okay. And compared with the 60s and 70s, many countries have much larger government debt. So therefore, money, I think monetary tightening has much larger implications for fiscal side of the country. And in your opinion, how so does this affect the central bank's ability to fight against inflation. Oh, okay, thank you very much. That's a great question. Um, and it's sort of a huge question. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've, I sort of ignored the, the debt issues um, other than in that last slide where <clears throat> I made the point that the consensus seems to be away from having the Fed be the primary actor in short run stabilization policy and fiscal policy playing a, a, a more active role, uh, where then debt issues become more important, I think, to, to think about. And we know there's a, a large literature that shows how, you know, the ability of a central bank to have an independent central bank that can focus on maintaining low and stable inflation while responding flexibly to help stabilize the real economy really is conditioned on the behavior of the the um, fiscal authority uh, and the fiscal authorities behaving in a in a way that that is uh, one might call sensible, so that they're concerned about issues of debt sustainability, uh, and the central bank can then focus on inflation and and macro stability. Um, the higher uh, debt levels, um, uh, well, two things. One is, you know, there is. Um, clearly has been an increased role of uh, fiscal policy in the U.S. in particular uh, during both the financial crisis and then now the COVID recession uh, that and actions by the central bank that have clearly crossed what used to be sort of the line between what we think of as monetary policy and what we think of as fiscal policy. 
Um, the Fed has done a lot of stuff affecting the maturity uh, structure of outstanding debt that the Treasury could have done, that we would think of that more as, um, as fiscal policy. And I think that creates um, tremendous political problems for the Fed for exactly the reasons you highlighted. As the Fed starts raising interest rates, uh, that has an impact on the fiscal side of the House. And in, you know, sorry, basic models like the one I looked at where the Fed or the central bank can behave independently, behind the scenes, the implicit assumption is that, well, if that increases uh, interest cost of serving the debt, the fiscal authority is very, uh, is going to raise taxes or cut expenditures or do something to help maintain a, a fiscal sustainability. And that's a really a political economy question. It's hard to see in the U.S. sort of Congress taking um, actions to <laughs> to raise taxes or or cut expenditures. Uh, and so um, then you run into the situation of are we in a regime where we have both sort of active monetary policy and active fiscal policy? And we know that that can lead to, um, well, our models give us very little guidance because there may not be an equilibrium that the model can, can pick out. The more you know, sort of practical implication is that I think there are um, would be strong political pressures that may come to bear on the uh, Federal Reserve and other central banks because of the, the the fiscal implications of what they do to bring down inflation. And again, I think Ken mentioned or discussed some of those in his talk about how they might threaten central bank independence. Though I do, I agree that it's a uh, potentially a large concern. Thank you. 